Baleen whales use sound to communicate with each other, uh, to check out whether anybody's home, to call each other in courtship, and also possibly for long-range navigation. They can obviously have very good low-frequency hearing. They can probably hear coastlines, seismic activity in the mid-Atlantic ridge, ice in the Arctic. They can probably hear all these low-frequency sounds and find their way around that way. But echolocation for food? No. I'm going to take you on a little journey through, uh, actually I don't want to say my inquisitive mind because that could scare a lot of people off, but I, it is the process of discovery in marine science and particularly with marine mammals that uh, there's so little known in so many areas that we are frequently led in directions we didn't anticipate. Um, so I'm going to start first in, I'm, and I'm going to take you through the origins of the study, which are really derived from, uh, from uh, fishermen, believe it or not, and secondarily um, through some acoustic stuff, which you didn't anticipate, and then we'll move on to both the questions of vision with regard to color and then what animals do at night. Now, both right and humpback whales get entangled along the east coast of the United States at rates that are really unsustainable for both species. And the North Atlantic right whale in particular is the most endangered of large whales with about 500 animals um, surviving at this time. Currently between two and four right whales die from entanglement each year and we are up to now 83 percent of the entire population has been entangled at least once. And our failure to solve this problem will both jeopardize the whales and a number of fisheries if we can't figure it out. Humpbacks number about 900 in the Gulf of Maine. These are the most popular for whale watching. Lots of people have seen them. Probably most of you have. And uh, they too get entangled in fishing gear at extremely high rates. The same questions apply here, but most of my research has been focused on right whales, largely because the work has been done in the springtime in uh, Cape Cod Bay. It's at a time when whales, when right whales spend a lot of their time at the surface, so you can see responses to various stimuli. Humpbacks don't do that. It's much harder to study them. So the thing about the entanglement problem is that in spite of 20 years of research and uh, management and regulatory activities, we're still looking at an increase relative to the total population growth. And growth in the right whale population is about 2 percent. It's a little bit more in humpbacks. Uh, but in both cases, entanglements are growing at a faster rate. About 10 years ago, uh, fishermen asked me why whales didn't see these ropes and avoid them. And the question could be applied across the board to bycatch in a number of uh, whale species and in dolphins as well. Well, it's, so it's a good question. So we set out to see if we could figure out some parts of that question and furthermore to see if we could develop ropes that would provide whales either a visual deterrent or an early warning so that they could avoid them. Uh, but first I need to dispel a myth, and I'm going to make a lot of noise to do so. Um, sonar is the ability of animals and submarines to bounce clicks or pings off of the objects around them and get information back from the echoes that sort of define the nature of that object. So in the case of dolphins, they're looking for fish. In the case of bats, they're looking for um, moths or something to eat. But um, People tend to think of whales, that whales use sonar, all the baleen whales use sonar as well. And even if the internet says so, it's not true. <laughs> so there is no evidence, and I've been part of experiments to do this, to study this, there is no evidence that baleen whales use sonar ever. And that means that uh, the next step for us is to really look at, uh, at eyesight. So just for an example, I'm going to show you how we know something about this. The um, echolocation uses clicks so that you get a very sharp echo that gets back to you. And um, this is what a sperm whale sounds like. And uh, this is a this is a, a common dolphin, Delphinus delphus. Uh, actually, a group of them, and you might want to hold your ears. Now, 
Now the squeals upward are actually a simul are single clicks that are used for echolocation. As the dolphin gets closer to the fish, the frequency goes up because the clicks get closer together. So we hear it as an increase in frequency. What the dolphin hears is better resolution about what shape the fish is, how big it is, maybe how good it's going to taste. <laughs> <clears throat> so. Uh, that's how an echolocation sounds like, a variety of things, but they're all, all based on clicks. This is what baleen whales sound like. This is a humpback song, and um, this is a male humpback, and we think this is what they used to call the girls. Now this is a right whale, and this is an up call, the most common call made by right whales in the North Atlantic. And this is a call that basically is uh, you go into a dark room, you don't know if anyone's there, so you say, anybody home? That's what right whales do in this case. Not very exciting, but serves a purpose. This is how right whale girls call boys. So that's, this is the, these are the characteristics of uh, baleen whale sounds. They tend to be uh, sweeping calls, low frequency groans, very few pulsive click sounds. And the differences are very apparent when you listen to them. Um, so what we're left with is an understanding that baleen whales use sound to communicate with each other, uh, to check out whether anybody's home, to call each other in courtship, and also possibly for long-range navigation. They can obviously have very good low-frequency hearing. They can probably hear coastlines, seismic activity in the mid-Atlantic ridge, ice in the Arctic. They can probably hear all these low-frequency sounds and find their way around that way. But echolocation for food? No. So, how do they find food? And um, this has been a puzzle for uh, whale researchers forever. So we look at the other sensory system that we're familiar with, which is eyesight. And here is a right whale actually coming toward you in the screen. And there's uh, this line here is the lower jaw line. This is the top of the head. This is a what we call a callosity eyes. A, we call it an eyebrow, actually, in this case. And the eyeball is here. A right whale's eyeball is about the size of a grapefruit, but it's basically the same structure and shape and everything as a human. Okay, there will not be a test on the next two slides. <laughs> but I do need to just run through a few things with you. The typical mammalian eye is familiar uh, if you, you know, did height from high school biology, which you've all now forgotten. Uh, <clears throat> light enters from the left, is focused by the lens, strikes the retina in the back, and the rods and the cones uh, convert the light into nerve impulses, which sends it to the brain, which interprets it. Um, on the right hand side, the rods at the very back, so that's this section right around here, are shown in black and the cones are shown in colors. And there does appear to be color sensitivity for each cone. Both rods and cones have photoreceptive molecules that are full of light sensitive pigments that are activated when the light hits them. Rods tend to have a molecular structure that's sensitive to very low levels of light, but only marginally to color. Cones contain molecules that are sensitive to different colors, and also they give us, in the terrestrial world, visual acuity, so they're kind of the high resolution nerve endings. But cones are not sensitive to light when light gets dim, and you can test this for yourself. You just go outside on a moonlit night, everything looks black and white. And that's not because the light's not there. The moon reflects the complete spectrum of the sun, right? But you just can't see it because there's an inadequate light for the cones to respond. So now we're in a close-up of the retina. And this uh, is what a single rod cell looks like. It's basically like every other cell. It's got all the regular parts, um, you know, Golgi, mitochondria, nucleus, etc. Um, but the end at the, the north end of this thing is full of these disks, which are full of uh, pigments that are sensitive to light, photoreceptive molecules full of light sensitive pigments. And for those of you paying attention, you'll see that there are no cones in the baleen whale retina. I mean, I whited them out. I took the same image, but <laughs> anyways, this is, pro this is pretty much what we think is going on in baleen whales. They, absolutely, they have absolutely no cones. And um, 
It's very unusual in the mammalian world to see this, but it's a kind of a recent discovery that has big implications for our understanding of whale biology. And as you will see, it may have some advantages. Now the other thing that, um, there'll be no test on this either. The other thing you need to get is that um, each, each one of us has color sensitivity curves. Every species has one. There's even differences between individuals. Some, uh, the certain fairly high percentage of men are colorblind and some women, but it's more common in men. <clears throat> and frequently you drop out one color, one color only, like a lot of people drop out green. Um, so these are the color sensitivity curves for uh, three whale species and the common cow. The cow is to the right, it's number four. The peak sensitivity is here. And the way to read this is that this means that the eyes are sensitive to these colors along the bottom here. That spectrum is across the bottom and these are represented by nanometers, which is the way we measure the color frequencies. And if you, the peak of the color frequency, the peak of one of these curves is, uh, corresponds in the case of right whales with 493 nanometers. So you can see it falls squarely into the kind of blue-green section of the spectrum and that's what they're most sensitive to. Their sensitivity to other colors drops off fairly rapidly so that by, by the time you hit the fully green spectrum here, they have almost no sensitivity at all. And that's why we think of them as monochromats. Basically they see the world in a kind of black and white. <clears throat> now why is that? Well, it makes sense for whales and dolphins, and whales particularly because they're more, they tend to dive more deeply. Light penetration in the open ocean uh, in the blue-green spectrum only goes down to about 200 meters. Uh, other colors, especially red, go hardly anywhere in the ocean. So this light penetration actually allows whales that dive deeply still to have some visual capability in, the, uh, in daylight. Uh, the light penetration in coastal waters is generally reduced because of uh, uh, productivity. You get a lot of plankton and sediment runoff from rivers and things. So the, there's a bunch of reasons for that. <clears throat> but the problem with all this now is that, okay, we've got some idea that it's evolutionarily adaptive to have sensitive that sensitivity, light sensitivity in your eyeballs that is tuned to the area that you're going to be swimming around in. But how do you test color vision in whales? I mean, how do you test this? So we decided to do an experiment. Now, yes, this is where we go off the rails. Uh, these are not mice. You don't do lab tests like this. Um, but what we decided to do was to actually put fake ropes in front of whales uh, in Cape Cod Bay in the springtime while they were skim feeding and see if they were able to observe or and respond to those ropes as they swam up to them and then to test their color vision by putting these fake ropes in at different colors. And the idea was, and obviously because they're not lab rats and they're not mice and they won't do what you ask them to do, you have to go out and try to work with whatever is going on. Now whales in Cape Cod Bay are skim feeding back and forth across areas. They tend to focus on patches of food and they will stay back in that area for a while. So our job was to guess which way the whales were going, where the patch was, and then run the boat in front of them a couple hundred yards out, throw the ropes, ropes over the side and then turn around and watch and hope that the whales would swim somewhere near the ropes. <laughs> and believe me, th we did actually manage to succeed 150 plus times at this, but that doesn't, I, I don't remember, we didn't keep count of how many times we did not succeed. So the, the whales have their own ideas about things. Anyways, the results are extremely interesting. The, we, this is the fake rope. It was a uh, basically a one inch diameter PVC pipes. We would put two 10 foot sections together to make 20 feet, put a uh, buoy, and you can see it here. It looks like a lobster pot at the top, and then a weighted uh, a weight at the bottom. And the PVC, PVC pipe would hang vertically in the water column just the way a lobster pot would. So that was the idea. These are the colors we chose. And um, the thing that came out, we had, like I said, 154 trials, and the thing that came out of it was that, in fact, color made a big difference. 
So the mean distance, we, we're looking for that change in behavior when they actually make the change or make a move, close their mouths, move away, make a turn. Anything that indicates that they saw something in front of them when we're adjusting their behavior to change their skim feeding tra trajectory. So the mean for the red and the orange was 3.85 or 4.4, 4.14, and these were higher than the other two, which was black and green, and uh, the green was the worst. Uh, so in all these cases, these uh, seem to be significantly higher. The rope collisions seem to also substantiate this by showing us that, in fact, there were lower rope collisions in red and orange, a middle number in black, and a lot in green. Um, the differences were significant for both the red and the orange um, versus the green. So basically, green is a really bad idea to have in the ocean. Um, <clears throat> now, so one thing I want you to notice here is that the variance, that is the spread around the mean for the orange, which was the best or the highest mean value, is, is higher than the actual mean. So what was going on there? So this is what's going on. And it turns out that early in the morning, when the light is low, there's very little penetration into the water column. And therefore, whales didn't detect it quite as early as easily, and the mean detection level was about three. In the middle of the day, it was up around six, so it was way above what the mean is. And later in the day, you start to see it going down, although we didn't do, we didn't, we had uh, daylight until about eight o'clock, and we didn't actually get many trials after about six. So this actually really illuminated the next section of my research, which was, okay, so they see color, they respond to it at different distances, uh, but what do the whales see at, light, see at night? You know, what's going on when it gets dark? Um, so I will get back to this later, but I want to keep going a little bit with the color question. So I made assumptions that whales, this is the, the monochromat data came out of Jeff Fazek's laboratory about a year after I started this work. So we didn't know that whales saw in black and white, and I made the assumption that they were operating in color just like we were. So when I put the ropes in the water, I thought, well, okay, let's figure out what they're seeing and what would work if there's anything that makes them allergic to a certain color. And um, the ropes here, uh, you remember my brilliant idea about white rope. This is the white rope here. This is black, this is green. This is a red, a fluorescent orange, and an, a regular orange, okay? This is what the whale is likely to be seeing. Now the way this works is that um, this, because this background light here is the fre frequency that it, the whale is most tuned to, most sensitive to, this looks to them as white light. This is basically the background space light of blue-green is their most sensitive frequency. And what they're looking for then is light that does not transmit so well, or things that do not transmit so well in the water. So orange and red, as you know, if you've been diving in the Caribbean or snorkeling, you know that those colors disappear first. As you get your head underwater, you don't see any reds. And um, that's probably what's going on here. You'll also notice that the white disappears almost completely. And the reason for that is that uh, white and green, to a lesser extent black, reflect the ambient space light, and the white particularly just disappears into the background. The green is the same, just about the same color as the background space light, so that also mostly disappears. So that's the reason that um, this was a bad idea. Now, <clears throat> this window up here represents sort of the peak uh, frequencies of light that right whales see, and that sort of meshes with this. That's how I created this image that looks like a, uh, what we think a right whale is looking at. So why, why, why does it have this odd uh, black and white kind of view? So my colleague Jeff Fazek at Keene University started looking at right whale eyes about five years ago, about the same time I was starting to, uh, to work on this in the field. He wondered if this odd eyesight was related to their food. So he got some of their food, which is a tiny plankton about the size of a grain of rice called Calanus finmarchigus. It's a animal copepod. It's a little animal plankton called a copepod. And right whales feed almost exclusively on these things, you know, thousands and thousands of tons of them over years. 
Um, you can see a bottle of them here. They have a nice pink glow or red glow to them. And in a close-up micrograph, you can see actually there's a lot of red pigment in this animal. So then he looked at this. He, and ignore the right-hand curve here. Just pick out the left-hand curve, which is the peak sensitivity of right whales. And then look at the transmission spectra for Calanus finmarsicus, the prey species. And that is this series of lower, th these three lower curves here. And what this means is that Calanus transmits uh, light in a red frequencies. And you can see where this goes up, it's basically all red and orange. And that happens to be right where the right well sensitivity leaves off. These are perfectly matched. What that means is that the whale sensitivity sees, the, the whale with sensitivity sees the white space light, which we think of as blue-green, and anything in the middle that is red will show up as a shadow. So if I can illustrate, this is from, uh, this is actually krill. Uh, uh, from National Geographic, and this is what a swarm of krill or calanus looks like underwater, very red. But if a whale looks at it, it probably looks like this. So what they are likely to be doing is evaluating the space light and the objects in front of it to determine whether there's an adequate food supply. If there's a black shadow of some kind, they can probably figure that out. So this is likely to be a feeding strategy for close range. So, in the end of the day, we, we th we've discovered that right whales don't see color the way we do, but that um, they do work, that color actually works on them for, with regard to uh, things like avoiding ropes and objects and probably finding food. And um, we also learned that uh, both white and green were a bad idea. If you were going to go fishing, that would be a bad thing to have in the water. Um, and we also learned that sometimes, no matter what the color is, you just run into things. So all animals make mistakes. Chimpanzees fall out of trees. Right whales run into ropes. And uh, it's just the way it is. However, there is, there is the evidence in this experiment that indicates that uh, color can improve the odds and, uh, of not running into things. And we're hoping that that uh, is able to move some of this entanglement problem forward. Now, a couple of things to say about it. One is that uh, the effect is definitely underwater visibility dependent. So if the water is full of plankton or mud or, uh, you know, it's particularly bad, then it doesn't really matter what color it is, you're going to run into it anyways. And um, it led to a bunch more questions. One is, does a one inch piece of PV pipe, P PVC pipe is that equivalent to a 3 8 inch lobster line? Can the whales resolve smaller diameter ropes? Can they see, how, how good is their resolving power? We don't, just don't know that yet. Um, and what about the darkness question? Is the evidence indicates that they stopped, they, that they definitely did not see, have the same detection distances as the light got dimmer. So that's a question that we have to tackle next. So, I decided to actually do some nighttime work to see if I could uh, develop some tools to look at that. And um, started with, um, we started with some uh, technology that's, the technology for this nighttime, night vision work is extremely, uh, has been evolving extremely rapidly and there's a bunch of new things that uh, we can look at and I'll show you some of the toys. But uh, the thing about this is that the knowledge of whale behavior, everything you read in the books and all the field guides is based upon what we have seen in, in the daytime. That's what we do. We go out in day, we look around, we say, oh, that's what they do. And we haven't actually spent any time looking at whale behavior at night. Um, generally, we have no idea about it. There's a little bit of tagging data that shows they do some of the things that they do in the daytime, but there's tagging data that also shows they do different things. What usually happens is the tags pop off right around sunset, and so we don't learn much. <laughs> but since most, most uh, land mammals exhibit changes in behavior from day to night, it seemed reasonable to me that we should expect some changes in whale behavior at night. So in order to look at that, uh, I needed to evaluate the different technologies. Here's some of the tools uh, and toys. On the upper left is something called a sofa deer. 
infrared camera. It's an Atom 1024. It's the highest resolution uncooled infrared camera on the market. Um, then we also went with, uh, Sony has come out with a, a fancy new camera with an ISO rating, a very extremely high sensitivity rating of 400,000. And Nikon has, uh, Sofredeer also makes a, um, it's basically a light intensifying tube, much like the night vision scopes that you see in the military. Um, so I got one of each of these things, and we went out to see what was possible. Um, and we discovered that all of them work pretty well, and they work for different things. So the Sony A7 actually was pretty good. That's at 9.30 on April, so that's, uh, that's pretty dark. And you can see, um, I think that's Boston in the background. And then uh, about the same time for, uh, these are both fin whales. Um, ISO, ISOs were 65,000. Anyways, you can see it gets kind of grainy, and it turns out that this camera stops being useful when it gets really dark. So a lot of cameras and a lot of the technology works at pretty good levels up until it gets really dark, or if you have a cloudy night, moonless night, any of those things. But the infrared camera, and uh, I want to clarify this, infrared is, uh, you know, it's both emitted and transmitted, and um, it's a tool that is extremely useful for a number of diagnostic features. You can actually tell temperature differences. But in this case, we use false color a lot because it would show, uh, it would show, for example, heat signatures at a farther distance. And if you set the temperature to red on the warmer parts, then a blow from a whale would show up in the distance much more easily than staring at black and white all the time. And it turned out that uh, working with this stuff at night is extremely fatiguing. Imagine just watching a, uh, well, in fact, I'll get to show it to you, but uh, <laughs> an extremely boring piece of real estate that is flat in black and white for six hours on TV. Doesn't that sound like fun? So in this case, in this particular image, the whale is a little warmer than the surrounding areas. The people are quite hot, and the water is cooler. Uh, this is the light intensifying scope. It's about, again, about the same time. And you can see it's really pixelated, the, vis the, the vision. Uh, th these don't work as well as you wish. Uh, and that same whale was seen caught in the infrared image as well. Uh, again, you can see the hot, hot feature of the animal at the, on the upper right there. And uh, this is what I meant by using the false color, is that you can see the blow here is hotter than the surrounding air, so it actually gives out a, a signature that is quite bright and visible from quite a distance. So what we're looking at is a couple of humpback whales, and we were able to follow small groups of humpbacks up to about 20 minutes at a time. But what happens with a, with a camera-based observation system at night is that it's a relatively, I mean, this is a pretty wide angle lens, 10 millimeters, but it's, it's not like, it's the equivalent of a 30 millimeter if you're accustomed to 35 millimeter cameras. So something on the order of 90 degrees. The problem with that is that you need four of them to cover all the surrounding area, and inevitably, whatever direction you're pointing at, the whale comes up over there. <laughs> so that's a bit of an issue. Um, we cheated. We use sound a lot. If you have a good weather, you can sort of put the camera in a direction and just listen for where they come up. So, so one of the things that uh, came out of this particular part of the study was that we noticed that whales tended to stop feeding at night, in the, at the nighttime, and they started to travel more and dive longer. And we lost them frequently after longer dives. <coughs> So we also did some aerial work, and um, one of the things that we discovered in this uh, was uh, something very surprising. And this this work is at uh, was done uh, not quite at dark. So we found a big cluster of right whales in Cape Cod Bay, and they were skim feeding at the surface. And what they were leaving behind, and I'd never seen this before, were tracks. And what was going on is that as the whale is swimming along and its tail is doing this, it's bringing uh, 
cold water up from beneath, and it leaves what, and this false color image shows up as a purple cold water spot. And so the whale has traveled, in fact, there's two of them, have traveled here, they crisscross themselves down like that. So I'd say in conclusion, uh, the lessons that I've taken away from this is that it appears that whales are far more dependent upon eyesight than we previously thought. And uh, we really just begun to scratch the surface on how well they can see, and already there are more questions. Uh, these animals probably depend upon um, contrast much more than we anticipated. That, so color matters, but not the way we think about it. Color matters because different colors create different uh, levels of contrast in the water column. And um, things that are red or orange create a very high contrast object in the water column and therefore are easier for these animals to see. And, um, but we don't really know about some of the other whales. We know about humpbacks, uh, fin whales, bowheads, and right whales. All are monochromats. We don't know much about the dolphins and some of the intermediate sized whales. And uh, we really don't know how good their ability is to see really small objects. One of the things that is peculiar is that um, not knowing the resolving ability and knowing that right whale food is this size, it must be a lot, there must be some threshold at which they see a cloud of that, of those copepods in a way that creates a shadow that allows them to trigger feeding. But we don't really understand that. And one of the questions about this was, uh, did they stop feeding at night when we were watching them? Did they stop feeding at night because they could no longer detect the high contrast of the prey species? If so, that gives us a little bit of a clue to work from uh, with regard to night vision. And then um, part of this as well, as you can see, uh, because we started with entanglement issues, I wanted to know also about what whales did at night, largely to see if they were a higher risk from entanglement. Are they uh, swimming around gear at night and not seeing it, or are they more at the surface, or are they more at depth? Uh, so this is a part of the, the development of this research was to understand the technology that would allow us to answer those questions, but we haven't answered them yet. Um, so we've seen this evidence that they change their behavior at night and really have to ask the question, is that because their vision is daylight limited? Is it adapted to daylight and therefore the nighttime stuff is more acoustic? Uh, the hydrophone work that other people have done does indicate that you hear, for example, in humpbacks, you hear a lot of chorusing or co what communication sounds in the evening, but not so much later at night except on full moons. So it's possible that during a full moon, there's more light going into the water column and they're more able to see one another. I mean, we really are just scratching the surface on this. So, and I'd say that uh, getting a better handle on these questions is really going to require a combination of laboratory and field work. And the laboratory work uh, is being done by Jeff Fazek and other laboratories. Also, there's a Sanke uh, Jorgsen at Duke University. And these guys are actually looking at um, the retinal, the pigments that are found in the retina to try to determine how sensitive they are to stuff. And now they're going to be looking at the res resolving power of the retina as well. Um, so there's a lot of laboratory work that needs to be done to follow up on this. And then following that, we probably need to do some imaginative field work to figure out whether what they find is actually true. And um, particularly with regard to the night work, it's going to require a lot of sleepless nights. Thanks for your attention. I had a student ask me today, and I don't know the answer, about whether eye, whales have different eye colors. Whether whales have different eye colors. I don't know if I've been that close. I mean, I've seen, what happens is that when you uh, take a picture of them, you get the classic uh, photographer's nightmare, red eye. Red eye. Yeah. <laughs> so you don't really know too much. I, I don't know about that. I don't know, anybody seen a whale eyes up close? All the ones I've seen are bluish, um, bluish gray. Blue gray? All of the ones I've seen. Huh. I think it's their contact. <laughs> Can you speculate on different whales um, perhaps having different types of uh, uh, black and white contrast and or color contrast based on the types of foods they feed on and the depths that they feed at? I think that's a great question. Uh, 
And in fact, uh, it seems likely to me, not we don't have all the data in hand, that uh, an animal like a beaked whale, which feeds at uh, you know a thousand feet or more, uh, might have a different adaptation. They're primary; they are echolocators, so they're not dependent upon vision for food, but they are dependent upon vision for mating and everything else. Th but they live in a clearer water column, so they may be more blue shifted, more deep, uh, you know, more deep ocean shifted. Whereas animals like bottlenose dolphins, which tend to live along the coastal waters, they may be more shifted toward the green or the you know, because of the, just because the water is greener. I, I don't actually know the answer to that, but it's a good question. Do we know anything about their sense of smell? So, all the baleen whales have this thing called the vomeral nasal organ. Basically looks like your nostrils in the tip of their snout. No one has actually traced any nerves back from the vomeral nasal organ back to the brain, so we have no idea what it does. But, on the other hand, we know that they have taste buds, and taste and smell are pretty much two sides of the same coin. And so it's very likely that uh, there is some sort of taste smell receptor. And uh, one of my colleagues here thinks that they actually find food by smelling or tasting copepod poop, and, which must leave a trail, right? And there must be a lot of it because there's millions of tons of copepods. And so if you're swimming through the ocean randomly and you happen to come across that smell, you know that food is nearby. It's entirely possible. Okay, the second question first. Do the tracks have some relation to the ice stop or are they just a tool? So the thing that was important to me was to is, I mean, I was obviously developing the tool, but the thing that was important to me was to figure out the behavioral changes related to nightfall. And so the fact that they stopped feeding indicated something about that transition from dusk to dark that changed their behavior. And that's about all I can say about it, but it's interesting. And the other question was, do whales sleep? Um, we don't we don't know, those of us who've been in the field a long time have run across whales that are absolutely sound asleep. Uh, you can drive a boat right up next, uh, we ran across a sleeping right whale, parked the boat next to it, waited for it to wake up. You know, we wanted to get photographs. You can't photograph it when its head is hanging down and it's, you know, <laughs> and there was a temptation to take a boat hook, you know, but no one did. Uh, and eventually the whale woke up and was like a little startled and then just kind of swam off. So that we know they sleep. There is some evidence in some dolphins that they sleep with half their brain at a time. And in fact, that evidence is now being extended to humans. If you go to a new hotel, apparently, you sleep badly the first night and you sleep better the second night. And they think it's related to our ancestry when if you were nomadic and you came to a piece of real estate that you didn't know very well, you would be on alert all night. And then the second night, if nobody ate you, you'd be more relaxed. <laughs> so, I don't know. We don't know much about sleep. The question is about the field of vision of whales. So, um, uh, let's see, maybe I can do this now. The whales are shaped like this, right? Okay, you're looking straight down on top of a whale. The eyes are out on the side here like this, very similar to a horse. They do bulge out much more than you can imagine. And they probably, and they rotate within those sockets pretty far. So that they probably can have binocular vision, but not directly at the nose. Um, they may work independently. We think they probably do. And we think that the collisions that we saw, many of them were because the whale approached the rope absolutely head on and never saw it, just like, just like a horse. So, but we don't, <clears throat> you know, the baleen whales have these, uh, the, the position of the eyes of baleen whale make you think of rabbits and things, you know, prey species on land doesn't really make sense in the water the same way, especially if you're really big. There's not many people out there eating you. So it doesn't make sense. And you can't see more than 40 or 50 feet anyways. So it doesn't make sense to have eyes that can look for predators. It makes more sense that these eyes are related to spatial orientation in the context of the surface and food and mates and everything else. So, Okay, the question is about whether those uh, um, water body differences we saw in the IR camera were related to submarine topography or, or oceanography. And uh, 
It was actually in the southwestern corner of the Cape Cod Bay area. It's pretty flat, not too interesting. Um, there, uh, the thing that I thought about that whole event, because it was so unexpected, it caught me so off guard, was that I was looking, uh, I don't know if any of you know about optimal foraging theory, but the early work on it was on house flies on countertops. And the, uh, the notion is that you, you know, you wander around randomly until you find in what's called sort of far field searching until you find something to eat, and then you focus more specifically on that. So the thing that I thought about when I saw these right whales is, oh my goodness, I'm looking at optimal foraging. They're moving around in circles, and if they don't find what they want, they move longer trails, and it looked very similar. And the thing that I thought about those water bodies was that you could use actually the water bodies if they represented plankton as a way to actually watch the whales do their foraging thing in the context of the prey. But that's, I'm getting ahead of myself, that's just my little dream, so. Why are the lines green and black? I think it's an artifact of history. I think when people started making polypropylene ropes, that uh, it's a, it was more challenging in the very early days to make any color, so black came out. The green, I have no idea, maybe it turned out that they liked the color, you know. I actually, <laughs> When I presented this work to the Maine Fishermen's Forum, uh, everyone was very interested. The fishermen were thinking, well, gee, I could fish red rope. But there was a guy in the back who said, I used to fish red rope, and it turned pink. I ain't fishing no pink rope. <laughs> so there you go. So does the changing the color of the rope affect fishing? In the case of uh, most of the gear that we're talking about, we're talking about the vertical lines that entangle and kill whales. And the vertical lines are not actually the active fishing part of it. So uh, these are usually attached to lobster traps, and lobster don't care about color. And they certainly don't care about the ropes. Uh, or they're attached to gill nets, and again, the gill nets are attached, you know, the ropes are attached at the end of the gill nets so they'd never be seen by the fish. So not likely to be an issue. It hasn't, it hasn't, none of the fishermen seem worried about that. So, which is the first sign that you're in trouble. Yeah. Are there other marine mammals that have just rods and no cones? Because the human example in which there are no cones, humans with no cones are legally blind. They only see the biggie. Cool. So uh, are there any other examples of marine mammals? So as far as we know, all the baleen whales have no cones. Um, there apparently is a ter one terrestrial mammal that has no cones. What our lab researchers think is that they made up for it by packing more rods in so that the resolution that they have is better than what we would expect from a rod-only animal. But I think they're still struggling with this. We, it's very difficult for the laboratory people to get really good tissues because when a whale dies, it usually floats ashore and it doesn't come ashore until it's been dead for, I mean, this is too much information, right? No. Anyways, they rot. So they're heavily insulated, they cook inside, and the eyeballs tend to be pretty deteriorated. So getting fresh retinal tissue is extremely challenging, which is why that question might, you know, might, wait, it might be a little while before we get to it. Good question, though. Thank you. Yes, thanks, thanks, Pat. If we started out as kids and didn't put shoes on and wore open-toed sandals and really let our feet develop as much as they could, I think that would be the best thing. But we have gotten into, uh, you know, the developed world tends to wear shoes and they tend to wear shoes that are cushioned and certainly motion control. So our feet get weak and they get tight often.